Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. You might remember our recent weekend show and podcast. We talked about some big news remember in the world it. of hospitality. Remember it. I loved it. I'm not talking to you. Okay. <laughs> um, Michelin is capitalizing on its renown as an arbiter of fine dining through its annual Star Awards for restaurants. Remember, those max out at three stars. What they're doing is they're making further inroads into the hospitality sector. So, Carol, to that end, mm. the Michelin Guide this month awarded its first honors for hotels, giving just 24 establishments in France the highest three keys rating. So instead of thinking about stars for restaurants, think keys for hotels. Makes sense. And now these keys are coming to the U.S. Uh, we've got a great guest with us. Uh, Gwendol Polanek is the CEO of the Michelin Guide. He joins us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. First of all, is it Michelin or Michelin? How are you supposed to say it? In France, we say Michelin. Michelin. Okay. <laughs> Sold. Um, How does Carol Masser say? Mm. <laughs> it's just so funny. Like, we talk about it in the newsroom. First of all, welcome. So nice to have you here with us. Um, you know, it's interesting to see how you guys have done. It's not a pivot because you're still doing restaurants. But talk to us about what your thinking was of expanding into the hospitality, further into the hospitality industry. Remember for sure, and uh, what, what people know, of, obviously, uh, are the famous Michelin stars, uh, highlighting the best restaurants in the mm -hmm. world, as well as uh, famously anonymous inspectors. But uh, what people don't know is that Michelin has been rating restaurants for the beginning of uh, the last century, because first it was both an hotel and restaurant guide, and uh, we are really uh, back uh, in this industry with uh, selection and recommendation of the best uh, hotel in the world. Two weeks ago, we revealed the first uh, distinctions with the hotel keys uh, in France, because it's obviously the first uh, destination in the That's world. That's what we talked about for our weekend broadcast, for tourism, yeah. yes. courtesy of our Pursuits team who covered it. It was great. Yeah, and, uh, and yesterday, because uh, the U.S. Uh, is the main uh, tourism market as a destination, but also because American people are traveling the world, we decided to disclose the first uh, keys for the U.S. So uh, 124 uh, properties have been awarded with one, two, or three uh, keys, and 11 with a th at the three-key level. Okay, take a step back and just, you know, the history of the Michelin Guide has been one uh, of, there's this, like, lore when you talk about the history of it, and the idea that the whole uh, motivation for creating this guide was to get people to travel to restaurants more so they could sell Michelin could sell more tires. And absolutely. And today, the Michelin Guide is still part of uh, the group Michelin. And uh, the original idea was just to uh, lead people to travel more, to help the motorists find their way and uh, find the best places to stay and to eat. Is that philosophy still 100% the same? I think the, the philosophy is still the same and uh, also the value, because what is core for the Michelin Guide is independence. We have a team of professional inspectors, so uh, working full-time for Michelin. It's great. And selecting restaurants and hotels, paying their bill in full to make sure that we share the most uh, trustworthy, reliable and up-to-date information to the foodies and travelers. So you can get a job just going to restaurants <laughs> and hotels. Sign me up. Yeah, uh, to uh, report on this, Carol. Uh, yeah, we have actually someone who does that. Uh, Kate Grader <laughs> goes to restaurants. Um, having said that, do you feel like, Wendell, that, um, we've got about 30, 40 seconds, and then we've got to do some news, and we'll come back and talk more. But do you feel like it's almost a sweet spot in terms of what's going on in hospitality? Because it does feel like while people might cut back, it just feels like everybody is out there traveling, and especially Americans, but in general. Yes, and definitely. We, we feel that there is a need because uh, there is basically too much information today in the travel industry. So people uh, need uh, a, an advice mm -hmm. to make up their choice. And uh, Michelin is, uh, is really a selection. So to ease your life and also to be an antidote to boring travel mm -hmm. because we are recommending places that, have a truly, uh, that are truly authentic, you know, that have a supplement d'âme, so that uh, have something as specific to offer to ensure a memorable experience. Well, and that's what we want to get into when we come back on the other side. Like, what is it that gives someone, you know, three keys, two keys, one key, uh, same things with the stars, like how you, how you rate, grade it and how you decide where you're going to go because there's so much um, out there. We're going to come back with Grendel Polnick. He is, of course, the international director of Michelin, uh, the guide uh, joining us. Actually, he is the CEO forgive me, of the Michelin Guide and joining us here in our studio. 
Gwendol uh, Polanek is with us, CEO of the Michelin Guide, uh, back here still with us in our studio. Um, we were kind of talking off air. John was part of this, um, too. And talking about, first of all, how somebody becomes an inspector um, in terms of really for the restaurants. It's rigorous. Talk to us about that. Well, let's say last year I received more than 8,000 applications to be an inspector. People don't realize that it's a full-time job, that we only recruit people that have uh, a formal training in the industry, hospitality or restaurants, back of house, front of house. Then they have been uh, you know, working in a restaurant or in a hotel. And then we have a training process about uh, two, three years with more senior inspectors on the field. And as an inspector, you have to eat out lunch and dinner about 300 times a That's year. Like me? I know. Look at it. Like, it sounds great, but it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot of food. Well, and you're not around in the, the evenings. Yeah, it's a, it, it, it's a lot, of course. But uh, wh- what is important is uh, they have to remain anonymous. Also, just to ensure they have a regular customer experience because right. we work for the customers. So they pay the bill in full as well. 8,000 applications for how many spots? So uh, today uh, we recommend worldwide uh, 16,000 uh, restaurants, uh, 6,000 hotels, but there are also a lot of uh, restaurants and hotels to visit without retaining them uh, as part of our selection. So there is a plenty of uh, restaurants and hotels to visit, but I won't share the number of inspectors working for me. <laughs> okay. Well, how many? But if, I they want are called inspectors, the, I want to, I want to get an idea <laughs> Undercover of, the, um, inspectors. of the rate of acceptance. So if you have 8,000 applicants, like, are they... Is, oh, oh, like, oh, only is it like getting into Harvard? Only very few. And uh, <laughs> like, are we talking like dozens of <laughs> spots? I'm not talking about no, no, the overall well, number of inspectors. What I can tell you is, uh, be, because today uh, we, are, we are covering the world yeah. and uh, we yeah. have Russian selection in more than 50 different countries that we have the more than 20 different nationalities of inspectors, uh, men and women. And uh, what is important uh, also is to be able to, to have a proper understanding of all the hospitality and food culture of the world. Because, for example, inspectors based in the US, right. they also contribute to the selection in France, in Europe, or in Asia, mm-hmm. as well as we have European or Japanese inspector coming to the US to contribute to the selection. You definitely obviously have standards. I get it. And you're being very, you know, you're very secretive because you want to make sure that what is reported is just very true and accurate. And um, I'm curious then as a result, is there a cap on the number of guides of places you would put out? Um, Because you are expanding a lot. So do you, to make sure that you are getting it right, is there a cap? No, we we are very consistent uh, with the the approach uh, as well as the value. So we have a, a no quota approach. So we recognize the quality where it is and whatever the style of the cooking, whatever the style of the place. Uh, So uh, it's really depending on what the destination has to offer. And what can be said is, you know, the culinary scene of the world as well as the hospitality offer is really booming in terms of quality and diversity. Um, Is there any chance that expanding can dilute the brand? Are you concerned about that? I would say on the contrary, because one of the strengths of the mission guide is first that it is a reference for the local people. Okay, Japanese people will consider the mission guide as the ultimate reference for Japanese food, the French as the ultimate reference for French food, whether creative uh, or traditional. So uh, we are the local reference. And that's the reason why the international travelers that trust the mission guide, because they will have access, ten- thanks to the recommendation of the mission guide, to an authentic local experience like i think people would be surprised that you guys are in colorado right you launched is it last year uh we, we launched it uh, last year last year so, okay so today yes we are covering uh, i would say only seven main destinations in the u.s with our ration selection but definitely the plan is to cover the u.s as a whole and uh, to be able beyond the u.s to recognize all the culinary culture and the hospitality culture of the world. So, so even if in a place like Colorado, where there's only maybe a handful of places that actually got a star from you guys, that's that's okay. That's that's valuable to you. Yeah, the, but the, the the point is, uh, you know, uh, more than ever, there are great places to recognize everywhere. Yeah. So, uh, because we don't compromise on the value of the ratings, and we need uh, resources to make it, we are expanding gradually, fast but gradually. And uh, the plan remains the same it's a, in the years to come to be able to cover the U.S. as a whole, to make sure that we left no stone unturned. So on that, how do you choose the cities that you're expanding to and, and when do you expand to them? And, and 
talk about detail like deals that you guys have with local tourism agencies. No, but f first of all, uh, it's always a mission decision first based on the culinary potential. Okay, and so we will, uh, in all priority, of of course, we we'll take into account also whether it's a uh, tourism hotspot yeah. uh, as well. And uh, what's the value of the mission guide? Because I think your question is related to the to, to the business model. Uh, is uh, let's say or qualify audience? Okay, the so discerning uh, foodies and travelers. And uh, basically, for the for the guide, we have the revenues uh, uh, from rations booking. Okay. From hotel bookings. Okay. Of course, and we have also partnerships uh, with uh, you know brands, fashion, food, and beverage that are willing to be exposed to our discerning and audience. And tourism agencies. And tourism agencies or governments uh, that are willing to leverage on the mission guide as a platform to promote uh, their destinations. But you're not going to do it if you don't like the place. Uh, obviously, uh, okay. you know, we, we have a lot of demand to expand. Yeah. Uh, today, uh, we have to manage expectations because uh, inspectors are a scarce resources. We need to hire them. Yeah. We need to train them. So we expand only when there is a very uh, mature uh, culinary potential. Is the Michelin Guide profitable on its own? On its own, it's uh, really sustainable, but I won't be able to share the detail of the results because it's uh, Michelin as a group don't share the details of the different uh, business line results. I want to know what an inspector makes. <laughs> it doesn't. An inspector, you know what an inspector doesn't make? Come on, is an it like An inspector doesn't above? make any food for themselves <laughs> because an inspector's <laughs> eating well, every meal. if it's a really hot restaurant. <laughs> that but uh, that's, a, that's a good point. You know, t today sometimes it's quite a challenge to get access to the, some of the restaurants that are almost that's overbooked. That's a good point. So, uh, if there are nobody. And yeah, they, they, they have to, to blend <laughs> in the crowd. So uh, we uh, do not have VIP treatments. So we have to queue, we have to make sure that we are pushing the doors, but uh, we also have to change the phone numbers and the credit card numbers to make sure that we remain anonymous. <laughs> How many that times does an inspector else. have to eat at a restaurant to uh, make a determination? So uh, one of the golden rules is that the same inspectors is never going back twice to the same restaurants. Ah. And instead another inspector or several inspectors, we come again and again, but then it's up to them to decide uh, how many times they have to come back. You know, it's depending on the consistency of the food uh, offer. And it's the same for the hotel. You know, we come as often as necessary, but it's truly a human approach. It's not an algorithm. It's about uh, living the experience yourself. How many uh, stars do you think uh, he's going to give us after this interview? <laughs> I don't know. I'm a little afraid. <laughs> but I know if you, you give us... <laughs> how many stars would you give us? <laughs> well, at least um, three for the smile. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, this has been so cool and so interesting. Promise you'll come back as you guys continue to uh, expand uh, the brand. And, and uh, yeah. Next it, time in disguise, though. Merci et bon appétit à tous. Ah, oh, lovely. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Grendel Polanek, he is the CEO at the Michelin Guide, joining us here in our studio. I'm going to go travel. Makes me want to go on vacation, makes me want to eat some good food in restaurants. I'm hungry. We're That's always so hungry. Nice. All right, this is Bloomberg Radio.